Well, I think I'm going to start, Maggie, um, because I think we should start. So um, a massive welcome to the Verdis Leadership Series this uh, wonderful evening here in, in the UK. It's a bit dark, um, but it's lovely to see you all. And uh, the Verdis Leadership Series is something we're very proud of. I know Natalie's very proud of, and I'll let Natalie welcome everyone in a sec. But the Verdis Leadership Series is now, is it two years old, Maggie? Yeah, two years old. Yeah, we're actually teenagers now. <laughs> two, two years old, and we've, um, we've meandered around many fascinating topics. And our uh, goal is to try and bring in very interesting speakers and have great dialogue. And really, we started our journey by live events that we did for, for several years, actually, where we used to meet um, in, in various restaurants and attached to meetings and talk about leadership topics. And then COVID hit us and then we went online. And I think we've gone from strength to strength and we've met some fantastic people. And I think tonight is going to be exactly the same. So I'd like to just uh, bring in... Uh, my dear friend Natalie, who's going to welcome the group this evening. Well, I mean, you've already done it, but I'm very pleased to see you all and um, to have a to have the opportunity to discuss this this very um, important topic, which is about the board and the role of the board and uh, um, what a board will bring to your company, because we've got one at Viedis and. It, our board has been absolutely phenomenal year on year for the last 10 years, actually. And uh, we've made mistakes, but they've always had faith on you, on us. And um, thanks to them and their support, we've rectified uh, the mistakes and, and moved on. So I have to say our board has been fantastic. Not every company has that, that, uh, that chance, actually. But uh, let's see what we all think about it. So welcome, welcome to all. Fantastic, Natalie, and thanks so much. Um, so the board, uh, the topic, and Charlotte, who's joining us, and uh, I thought I'd start this evening by just reminding myself of a book that I got on boards many years ago, which was called The Fish Rots from the Head. And that introduces, I mean, may, maybe the topic, which is a fascinating topic, which is, what is a board? And Charlotte, welcome this evening. Uh, maybe you could Dis uh, describe what you do, where you are, and uh, something about yourself. Sure. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, I live outside of Philadelphia now. I spent my career in the biotech uh, pharmaceutical industry, building groups like market research, competitive intelligence, strategic forecasting, decision science, all the insights, analytics groups to bring better fact-based decisions to what we were doing rather than sometimes seat of the pants. And I think that was one of the, the uh, capabilities that um, uh, several boards have found to be useful. I think also bringing a sense of independence. Now, I, my last uh, um, corporate position was at Shire, um, running the insights analytics groups and then leadership development. Um, and went right from there onto a public board, which is rather unusual. I was the senior vice president, but I wasn't C-suite. But I think bringing some of those capabilities to the board, which we will talk about and why, why and what boards are looking for now. So to me, board service is a different way to make a difference. And it's a terrific um, opportunity to keep um, making a difference. Fantastic, Charlotte. And I think a couple of key words there, you use the word board service which we'll come back to, because I think that's another interesting thing. So you've got a few slides that um, you're going to show, so maybe we can bring them up. And uh, the first thing is, I mean, the title, Boards That Rock. Um, I love that being, a, as you heard, a one-time salsa drummer. Um, but, I mean, you know, just start maybe with your story about boards and, and maybe right at the beginning, what's the purpose of a board? The purpose of a board is vision and supervision. So vision, setting overarching strategy and supervision, making sure that we're doing things the right, the right things and doing things right. 
So that's a lot of the compliance and governance functions. It should also be a collegial body. If you have a board that cannot um, get along, that's a board that is not really working and is not doing any service to themselves, to management or the company. I mean, I, I, we're back to, there is no book apart from the book that says you have fiduciary duty. There is no book that describes what the job of the board is. So in a way it's totally discretionary. So I'm back to what's the real purpose of the board and how do you, how do you uh, identify the purpose of the board? So, oh, I think if we go to the first slide, then we'll see what some of the issues are, what are boards looking for, which gives you an idea of what the role of the board should be. Um, I think one of the biggest things is that it was previously almost exclusively C-suite experience, which said that boards were looking for, in some cases, people who had led and driven companies. Now, that's all well and good, except that sometimes there is a... Uh, a time commitment issue. And sometimes there is a leadership issue in the sense that CEOs who have led companies what may want to do the same thing when they're on a board. And that's not the function on a board. The function is vision and supervision, not to run things. Um, as Matt Emmons, one of my board coaches who was uh, CEO of Shire and then CEO of Vertex um, said to me, I, I think one of the other things is that it, the board, uh, the people selected for boards knew one another. So I would be on Maggie's board, we'd both be on Joe's board, and that would be very nice because we'd all vote for each other. Uh, that doesn't happen as much anymore. And I think that point now, look, boards are looking for diverse levels, functions, and demographics, and particularly in areas of social media, global experience, marketing, IT, cybersecurity, HR, legal compliance, many other functions that were not looked at before. It was typically either CEO or CFO. And one of the other things that I think we've realized is because there have been some spectacular board failures, I would point to um, Boeing, would point to some change at, Ex at ExxonMobil recently, um, Johnson and Johnson at, at several points. So now looking at character, and I had the good fortune to be at Pharmacia under the uh, the leadership of Fred Hassan, and now character is really driving some of the selection criteria because that's important to bring to a board, judging others to. Uh, bring others on the board, collaborating. Again, a board that doesn't collaborate is a board that is not going to work properly and serve the interests of the company and management. Raising questions. I heard one expert say around 2013-14 that with all of the financial meltdown in 2008, that if more questions had been asked, and he said particularly many of the women that I serve on boards with, he said, if more people had said CDMOs, these collateralized debt mortgage obligations, what and why and how, if more of those questions had been raised, the financial meltdown might not have been as severe because a lot of people on the board didn't understand what they were, but worse, didn't ask about them. Earning trust, that you have the trust of the members, it should be a collegial board and emotional intelligence, bringing all of that to the board. So I think some of those characteristics start to indicate what boards should be uh, looking for so that they can- I, I, go uh, back, I, go back, I go back to my, what's the purpose? Because uh, in a way the board is responsible for the performance of the management team. Right. So by definition, you can't, you have another role other than vision and, um, and uh, governance, which is much more connected to um, a performance framework. And again, um, almost there is a supervisory kind of need, otherwise you can't measure performance. So how does, how does that all fit in with this? So it, it, technically the, the functions of a board are the fiduciary, the financial responsibility, a duty of loyalty, a duty of care, um, hire, fire the CEO and evaluate the CEO 
and manage risk. It's for really for risk mitigation, for um, overarching strategy, but again, in concert with management. So those are, I think that boards who, try, who function at a high level are the ones who are looking for risks, are looking to raise the right questions, are looking to make sure they've got good governance, but not looking to run the operations. But again, again, Charlotte, I'd say in, in, in the biotech world where nearly always uh, there's venture capital involved, <laughs> especially in, in uh, after a B raise, um, along with that comes a real strong desire from the investors to have control and um, to the point that they often put in entrepreneurs in residence nowadays. So how does that all fit in with, with this concept of the purpose of the board? And that's a very key question and a very difficult one to manage. And I um, have been and am on a board like that. And it tends to be one of the, the acronyms that's used is NIFO, nose in, fingers out. You're not there to run the operations, you're there to ask questions, but you're right, when you have investors, they have a much more um, interested role, shall we say, but I have found myself saying, we need to make decisions with our director's hats on, not with our investor's hats on, and we have to be uh, independent, and I think one of the key things now is to look out for all of the stakeholders. It used to be, and I was at the University of Chicago and took a course with Milton Friedman, who famously said, the purpose of a board is for the shareholders. Not anymore. Uh, the purpose of the board now is to look out for the interest of all the stakeholders. And that means employees and customers. Um, if you worry about your employees and get engaged employees, you'll have engaged customers and better business results of the community. So I think that's one of the biggest shift in boards is to look out for all stakeholders, but it's much harder for those VC people who are on the board, I found to do that. I mean, there's also, from my experience, there's a space between management and the board, which I often occupy, which is um, very interesting because if you're just involved in vision and if you're just involved in uh, governance where where is the think tank of the company so if you work for Roche or or someone when you go to a senior body above you there is an engagement and actually normally a very big value for when you arrive often the boards don't do that because as you say it's vision and governance so the poor old CEO stranded um, above maybe his management, actually he's squeezed, he or she is squeezed between management and the board. And the board should be a mentor for the CEO and typically that's a role that a lead director would play to be the, the conduit to the board and also um, someone right beside the CEO. Um, if there isn't an independent lead director, um, then typically it might be the head of the audit committee which serves that role because you're right, it's lonely at the top and the CEO always needs to have someone to bounce things off. It might be a small executive committee of the board. Um, that's where the, the collegial and relationship and trust is critical that the CEO knows that the board has her or his back and the board uh, knows the same of the CEO. Which is a good thing to say, but it's very hard to, to actually in practice get. I mean, yeah. I've been um, in many boards which have, it's been a fight. It's been always a fight. And um, so, I mean, is this, I mean, I, I, I totally agree with your concept, but again, there is no, there's no structure or, and it's all discretionary. As an independent director, I can either put a lot of effort in or I can put no effort at all. It's totally discretionary. And that really upsets me really, because when I first joined um, the industry, when I came from Roche into biotech, what I saw was a terrible, compared with what I was used to, terrible, um, if you like, advisory group that was around me. Now, I mean, how do you, how do we get an improvement at this or is it just 
bespoke per company? Well, I was on a board that was a public board that but was run as the family owned private company that it had been before it went public. And when I came on the board, I'd give it about a 2.5 in terms of governance. And several of us came on at the same time as independent directors and worked very hard and started having real committee meetings and um, executive sessions and coaching with the CEO and ultimately replacing the CEO. It took several years, but making sure that we were focusing on what we needed to do for the company. It's a longer term vision. If there's that kind of animosity and, um, and, and discord between the board and the CEO, um, it, Usually it's the CEO who will, uh, who will be replaced, um, unless the CEO has such a compliant board that he or she can replace the entire board. But now investors and are starting to push back, activist investors, and saying, this is not what we want in a board. You need to be worried about um, environmental, social, and governance, and if not, we're not going to invest in you. So I think those are a couple of the good trends that are happening now. Okay, let's, I mean, again, I, I, I understand what you're saying, but I do see that um, if you're going to take that, that view you had when you came in and you changed a lot of things, that you still need a board that is experienced in the substance of the company, and that if you've only got one because you've hired a set of diverse people, you're not going to be tooled up in, in order to run the com company. So, the diversity is great, but I mean, surely one of the keys there is not diversity of, of, of talent, it's diversity of thinking. That if you have a lot of people who've got experience in pharma, but they've all got different ways of framing things, it, that's the sort of diversity we want, surely. Absolutely. And if we look at the next slide, that is indeed some of the characteristics of high performing boards. And now that's exactly a diversity of background, thought and approach. Because if you have everybody thinking the same, we used to call it inhaling one CO2 or CEO2 that everybody around the table would agree. I've seen it on the management side and I've seen it now on the board side. But indeed, having balanced teams, varied perspectives. And that means um, somebody who will be willing to look at whether we call it the black swans or something. What's the worst that will happen? What's the biggest risk that we're taking? Have we thought about this? Those are the questions. If you don't have a board that trusts one another and can ask those questions and debate them, if you're inundated with a hundred pages of PowerPoint slides before the board meeting, that doesn't make for good discussion. Um, yes, the background, you have to do your homework too to keep up with the industry and then bring your questions and be ready for some very good, fierce discussion. This, this talks very, very loudly to the word chairman. And, um, you know, I know a lot of chair people who couldn't chair themselves out of a paper bag. Um, <laughs> so the question is, is how do you, because what you're showing me here is a pyramid, which at the top, it has an orchestrator, which is the chairman. So how does that work? Um, we've, I've been in boards where we've replaced the chairman um, because it was, uh, ineffective. That's where an independent lead director, that's where um, the, the independence of board members coming together. Um, I was on one board where the family decided that the board would be significantly downsized and all but two of us were removed because it was non-functioning. Um, and a new chairman was appointed for that very reason. Um, it t again, it takes a while and it takes courage. And um, sometimes these quote, Fights, whether it's a proxy fight or an internal fight don't work but you're right if the chair can't chair then a change has to be made but it can take some again, time. again again um again charlotte that the skills of a chairman aren't necessarily the way that people view the purpose of a chairman so often you bring in a chairman because they look good they they make the company look good and they don't have um the soft skills I know a lot of guys who are chairman who are very great transactional guys, but again, they've got no sensitivity to run this. So how do you, 
Because, I mean, what your whole thesis here is that almost boards need to have soft skills and hard skills. So the oh, question yeah. is, is, how do you get soft skills into these environments, especially with a lot of VCs that are involved? Well, I think that's the same question that we ask when we're hiring CEOs or department heads or even Jack Welch at the end of his career said um, this, he realized that the hard things were the soft things, the soft skills. And I think that's where looking at, um, at, at culture and looking at, uh, uh, at emotional intelligence, having good interviews, understanding, being able to judge people uh, properly so that we get the right chair, we get the right lead independent director, we get the right, just the same as if you were hiring a CFO. Um, and I think that that's becoming even more critical now um, to make sure that we have that balance. And just one question about life cycle of a business. So if you take the life cycle of a business may have founders in there for five, six, seven years where their shareholding is so large that it massively influences the direction of, of a company and the boards actually are very inert because they they can't really argue. So anything about life cycles of companies? Yeah, absolutely. I think that it, it uh, life, depending where the company is and the life cycle, it will take a different chair, president, CEO, um, if probably up and down the line. If you're in very early stages, you need an entrepreneur, someone who can raise money. If you're in later stages, somebody who understands governance and, and good management. Um, and I think that's one of the critical things of a board, too, is to understand where in the life cycle you are. I was on one board, and because of the information we had been fed, um, and I do say fed, um, we thought we were in a transition. Thank God we hired the right new CEO, who after about 37 minutes, realized that we were in a turnaround. Um, and as he discovered things and told us to the board, and that changed the entire way of the kind of information we were getting. Um, because I think uh, then understanding where we were was absolutely critical. And your comment about the founders, that, that really is very important. And I think one of the things boards have to be mindful of too is for all the strategic planning that we do also, if you're in a turnaround, or, or a crisis situation, there's no long-term without the short-term and making sure that we focus appropriately on short versus long-term depending upon where we are in the life cycle. Very interesting. Next slide, um, Charlotte. Okay. So, so we're talking about modern, right. modern boards. So what are, what, are, what are modern boards worried about? Well, technology and cybersecurity is a big one. Almost everybody's been hacked. Uh, the board where I sit on in, in France had, had one of these hacks. Almost every company is dealing with it and making sure that they're more protected. And that means having not just the right people in the company, but having enough knowledge on the board, among the board members to know what questions to ask. And if there is a problem, if it's being properly addressed, how do we monitor this performance? Um, and, and any of these, um, these issues. I mean, cybersecurity sounds expensive. And I mean, what, what VC is willing to put a lot of cash into cybersecurity? Um, if they want to survive, save the company and make sure that any intellectual property is protected properly, they will, um, they will make sure that the appropriate money is spent. Otherwise, they're, they're risking their own investment. So you've got a lot of sub-finance companies that are going to really struggle here. Yep. Massively. It's, right. And it, it hasn't been an issue as much recently. I mean, there have been little breaks, but we've seen huge breaks now in many companies making sure that they have a lot of the systems in place. And how do we as boards make sure that those are the appropriate systems? Very, very interesting. And then compliance? Well, anything, of course, in the pharma industry or in biotech or in any business that deals with the government, this has become much more important. These were functions that typically did not 
rise to the board level or you did not necessarily have anybody at the board level who who was an expert in it and now a lot of boards are saying we need somebody who again knows the questions doesn't necessarily set up the compliance but knows questions to ask the same as cybersecurity, making sure that we're doing the right things and we're monitoring if there are issues making sure that we're um, monitor, uh, uh, doing the right things to correct any issues and prevent issues in the future. Because again, a lot of that is under the rubric of risk mitigation and is the purview either of audit committee or um, in some cases, uh, REMCO. Well, it's one of the things that when I look at that worries me is that the so-called professional board joiners shouldn't really join a lot of boards because there's a lot to do per company. Correct. And some boards are limiting now um, the number of, of uh, boards, other boards that you can serve on. Um, the National Association of Corporate Directors estimates that it is a minimum of 250 hours per year for a public or private board in terms of the preparation, the meetings, the travel. And if you're not going to put in the time to do the preparation before meetings. And I've seen some board members who clearly did not prepare and they usually lasted one term um, because that's part of our, our responsibility, our fiduciary responsibility and due diligence. Interesting. And the whole world of environmental, you know, this, this world where you know, we're, we're moving rapidly into it. What, what's, what's your thoughts there? Well, this, this is the topic of just about every board webinar that, that I've been on the last couple of years. Um, the environmental social governance, some call it um, CRM, um, it, it, corporate responsibility. Um, but Larry Fink of BlackRock said, if you think, if any board or company thinks that environmental social governance are not having an impact on their bottom line, they're absolutely incorrect. Um, and activist investors are now starting to um, make themselves known, um, getting three board members onto the Exxon Mobil board. Um, the, in, the, the governance is in some ways, quote, easier because there are already Remco nominating governance committees that have been looking at a lot of these things. The environmental, what does that mean? Companies now looking at their environmental footprint. The social is perhaps the most difficult because it is anything from um, uh, in, in the United States, Black Lives Matter, um, it is pay equality, it is diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, demographic uh, variety. So there are a lot of aspects to it. And I think many companies are struggling with what does it mean uh, for us? What do we need to do what do we need to do differently? And how do we make sure that what we do is not the target of some activist investors? Um, and so I think every company is trying to figure out and what are the metrics? That's the, one of the questions I always ask. How are we going to modify? How are we going to monitor this? Very interesting. Um, moving on to the last slide, I think you have, or yes. Yes. It's really, I, I join the board for the right reasons. Understanding what a board needs. Some uh, bo different boards need different people and different skills at different times. But what the board needs, as Tony said, not just because you want to be on another board. Some companies, from a management point of view, some companies do not allow their executives to serve on boards. Some companies allow only certain levels only one board, only certain kinds of companies. Obviously, you would never want to go on a board where there was any kind of competitive um, concern there. So understanding that from your own management, if you're uh, currently in, um, in a company, and what the board needs and what you bring. Um, having a, a board bio, having a board overview, and the amount of time you can actually commit. Because if there is an issue, some kind of crisis, um, and I've been in several, you, it's 24 seven. You need to be all in for what the board, we've had meetings at 10 and 11 o'clock at night. On, we had meetings one day on New Year's Eve. 
So uh, um, uh, those are the kinds of things to make sure that you were ready to commit that. Um, and this, the next point probably seems redundant, but um, to do your due diligence before the interviews, Matt Emmons told me that he had a number of candidates interviewing for, for board positions and um, CEOs who felt that they were well prepared and knew enough and had no questions. And he said that um, that didn't, didn't fly with him. You want to, it's just like a quote, any job interview, you want to make sure um, that you've read everything. Make sure you meet as many people as you can, at least one other independent director, the CEO. So that you understand the culture and fit. Um, we talked a little bit about this before, the duty of loyalty, the duty of care, Good business judgment. Um, if you use your good business judgment, you um, won't be sued, essentially. That, um, that's one of the key things. If you have done your due diligence and you've thought about this and ask questions and you bring your best judgment and bring your independence. And of course the NIFO is nose in, fingers out, know when it is really management responsibility versus director. And sometimes that's difficult to separate. Well, that was fantastic. I and mean, we're bang on 30 minutes in. So I think we're spot on in our, um, in our timetable. So firstly, can I just thank Charlotte in a big way from everybody. That was um, intriguing and so much, so much to debate and discuss there. Um, just thinking about our timing, uh, Maggie, are we going to move into rooms now? Um, is that the best? Um, just to, I mean, no few questions in the chat which I think are very interesting and and people are really asking a lot of questions so, so I think it should we go into that or, or shall we go yeah, straight we should, we should we should run those questions before we go because it might have an impact on the breakout sure okay, so let's let's have a look at a couple of the questions so that we get that sorted so if I just go down to the bottom of the screen um, so if we go to the questions I mean the first one was from Rich uh, I've got loads of questions here. We might, we might spend the rest of the afternoon on questions. Rich, um, is the exec team responsible for setting strategy or just setting the strategy that the board set? I mean, that's back to sense of purpose. Um, Charlotte? You know, this is one that I struggle with. And there are some groups that say it's management that sets the strategy and the board um, oversees it, does pressure testing, um, it's others that say the board sets the strategy with management and then monitors the, um, the, the performance. And I see some heads nodding. I think it has to be both. You can't, you can't have a strategy that's imposed on management if they haven't bought into it, but you can't have a strategy that management comes up with and, and the board says, I don't know how you're gonna do this. So I look at it as, as um, making sure that all along, that's why we have strategy meetings and we just had one a month ago, bringing in some of the senior team and the board and really threshing this out. Now it's gonna be iterative. There will be things that they bring to the board. There'll be things that we go back to them. I truly, and I don't mean it to be a wishy-washy answer. I think it has to be an integral strategy that everybody buys into. I think one of the things is that, um... The CEO or the management needs to produce the straw man that the board works against. So it's it's not that for the board to come up with it. So the board works against it, and then when you work it against it, you synthesize it. And I think that's really the term. I think Salaman, Salman, that's what you were really saying. If you want to make a comment here, Salman, you're on mute. I shall unmute myself. Hi, my yeah. Friend. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think that's something that I struggle with and I struggle both at the receiving end as well as the giving end. Um, and I think the board, uh, we need to come back to the purpose, the main purpose of the board, Charlotte. And I'm sorry, but uh, you have not really touched uh, too much on that. I think the board's purpose should really be, how do you take a business from where it is today? How do you encourage that business to go from here to there? And the there is not 10 and 15% that a CEO does, but how do you get from there to 50% and 70%? So the board should really be uh, the kind of the motor for providing that kind of um, 
aspirational objective setting. Yeah. And of course, you need to get a buy-in also. I think that uh, the, what, what I struggle with, uh, and you mentioned that you have the same issue too, is when the board becomes too much involved in strategy and the CEO is on the other hand, perhaps getting a little bit aloof from strategy, right? So, I mean, how do you balance it? I don't, I don't have the answer, except that I think when I look at effective boards, they tend to be ones which again go for this vision and this aspirational objective and leave the rest to, to the executive team. If the executive team is not able to, to deliver, then it's perhaps it's not the right executive team. It, it agreed. And I think some of it is, I, I'm thinking of one board, I was on a board of uh, genetically engineered mice and rats for clinical trials. And a couple of the board members were talking about microbiome and mice space and great things, except that we were facing a turnaround. And that's where it was the short term. And, and that's why they were ultimately removed from the board, because it was clear we weren't there. We had to save the company first. So I think, again, focusing on that, the board and management um, were aligned with that. You're right. I think setting the vision um, is there. But again, with management buy-in, and what is it going to take to get there? And I think that's one of the, it's a difficult line to, 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 um, to keep that the board makes sure to ask questions about how are we getting there? How are we, what are the obstacles? How can we make sure that this happens without re actually running the, the, the operations? And a lot of that I think comes back to trust and good dialogue and making sure that, that we're, we're asking the right questions and trying to uh, identify the, the appropriate risks. 